Uh, whilst people find a seat. When I was in with the Secretary of State and he asked me why I wanted to be the Chief of the General Staff, I said clearly it was all to do with the opportunity and the fantastic responsibility associated with closing the Rusi Land Warfare Conference. <laughs> but I think we've had a tremendously rich day and a half. For me personally, it's been extremely valuable and a fascinating forum to hear about what the Army is thinking and to share impressions and insights with so many of our allies and partners. And can I therefore thank Karen and her team for laying it on, for General Swan and the Army Association of the United States, and clearly for our key major sponsors. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be where we are today. And for those who have travelled, thank you very much indeed for taking the time. I think we've covered a lot of important ground, far too much for me right now to do full justice to it. You'll all have your own, but I think on reflection, my key observations seem this afternoon to be revolving around the nature of competition, diversification, the diffusion of new threats, the scale, the pace, and the urgency of change. And I think I've detected a real appetite for change, especially amongst those with whom I had breakfast, which is encouraging because there's a lot on. The criticality of allies and partners, that's of course not new, but there are evolving opportunities and there's clearly a well of shared challenges. And very sensibly, we were treated to the insights towards the end of the morning. It behoves us never to lose sight of the fact that warfare is a human endeavor. But I think whatever you've personally concluded, I hope you all individually leave with a better understanding of the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead for us all. And I think some of them in the not too distant future, since I think we almost certainly still underestimate the change that's going to take place well within the next decade. That's well within the service lifetimes of many of you here this afternoon. And so this is a fascinating time to be a brand new Chief of the General Staff, literally brand new, first full working week. And a new chief gets literally hundreds of letters, some of them even quite supportive and encouraging. <laughs> but what they all do in one tone or another is to offer advice. And taken together, they reflect the opinions, the views, the prejudices of a wide community of informed security and defence observers. And of course, the odd crank. Occasionally, it's difficult to tell the difference. <laughs> but it's become a truism, they've generally asserted, that we live in exceptionally unstable times and that the world has never been more unpredictable. That is the condition of the world. It's always been unstable and it's always been unpredictable. And our current worries, many of them have asserted, is that it could certainly be much worse. After all, in the year that I joined the Army, we fought an unexpected war in the South Atlantic. We still had very significant forces committed to internal security in Northern Ireland. And we were confronted by what we then called the Group Soviet Forces Germany across the inner German border, equipped with, amongst other things, tactical nuclear weapons and a range of chemical and biological agents. And in all that year, 
we had over 280 soldiers killed, more than in any year since, more than at the height of Iraq and Afghanistan, and 28 of those soldiers were killed in the United Kingdom, 11 of them here in London, including the elder brother of a friend of mine. That's the real enemy, they say, and I don't disagree. But we don't live in the past, and certain fundamental changes seem to be underway that have real meaning for our future, much of it linked to rapid technological change, which I think does mark out the times we live in now from those that went before. The other leitmotif is the money. People worry about it. So how can we justify claim to resource over the heads of others? Well, to my mind, as compelling a case as any is that what can be afforded to defence should be in direct proportion to the threat. Just so long as we can demonstrate that our efficiency is at the very edge of arduous and exacting, whilst being consistent with our operational outputs and obligations. And I can't promise any respite in that regard. So I think, given I've only been in the job a couple of days, I thought in the spirit of the times I'd offer you something of a hybrid, one part reflection on the strategic context that we were discussing and hearing about yesterday, and one part on what I think is important for the Army in particular as I take over. And for those of you who've got planes and trains to catch and want it in a nutshell, my focus as CGS is the future, preparing the Army of tomorrow, which is why you'll find in the Army that I command some of the very brightest and the best of all generations in those appointments that signpost and shape our future. And the further out we're looking, the younger I want those teams to be which is going to be a challenge, given that the world's always been volatile and unpredictable. So what's so different today? I think it's not so much the reassertion of state-based threats, true that that is, but I think it is the pace of the change associated with the permanent and escalating technical revolution that I spoke about yesterday combined with the proliferation and cross-contamination of risks, compounded by the widening spectrum of threat. And I think we can all agree that the nature of warfare is broadening beyond the traditional physical domains, and that warfare today is characterized by a persistent and full-spectrum competition, whilst our own freedom to operate in time and space of our choosing is increasingly challenged by the proliferation of integrated land, maritime, air and space systems operating at ranges measured sometimes in the thousands of kilometres, whilst the pace at which strategic threats can now manifest themselves has accelerated exponentially. Cyber net speed, unconstrained by geography and the laws of nature, whilst the difficulty of attribution complicates our own response times and it emboldens the aggressor to ever greater risk. And of course, it's not just about the capabilities either. Malign intent and the inclination to use force today to change the facts on the ground seems to be on the rise. Putin's State of the Nation three months ago painted a darkening geopolitical picture. 
because Russia today is not a status quo power. It's in revisionist mode, and its intent is now matched by a growing arsenal of long-range precision capabilities. And it's not just Russia. We're confronted by the consequences of a global order challenged by other revisionist powers, rogue states that want a world shaped along their own authoritarian lines. At a minimum, they're a reminder that democracy and human rights are not universal values. But they're also a reminder, and I said it yesterday, that the international rules-based system isn't self-sustaining. It's underpinned by power, hard power, predominantly, although not exclusively, American hard power, which we Europeans can't take for granted. And the United States itself now recognizes that its military edge needs sharpening in responding to this expanding competitive space and the subsequent erosion of US-led military advantage. And what's true for the United States is also true for us. So I think that the misplaced perception that there is no imminent or existential threat to the UK and that even if there was, it could only arise at long notice is wrong along with a flawed belief that conventional hardware and mass are irrelevant in countering Russian subversion, and that the answer lies somehow in disruptive technology, and that the quicker that we can field those technologies, the less useful the traditional measures of combat power become as indicators of national power. To my mind, that's to misunderstand the Russian challenge. Their strategy of the integrated employment of political, diplomatic, economic, information and other non-military measures is predicated on a solid foundation of conventional military power, hard power. And their asymmetric approach is a deliberate and targeted strategy to expose Western vulnerability especially in the non-traditional domains. We may read Russia less well today than the Kremlinologists of the past, but their lack of respect for weakness, especially military weakness, hasn't changed one bit. And as we've become more skeptical about the necessity or the advantage of intervention, Georgia, the Ukraine, Syria, Montenegro, Libya, Salisbury. How much longer do you want that list to grow? So if we agree that the risks are potentially growing, then we need a more proactive, threat-based approach to our capability, including placing some big bets on those technologies that we judge may offer exponential advantage because given the pace of the race, to fall behind today is to cede an almost unquantifiable advantage from which it might be impossible to recover. The message is think big, start small, but hold the capability to scale rapidly. So I think the challenges for the Army today are fourfold. We need to address the proliferation and the diversification of the threats. And we need to work out how to create and then sustain an asymmetric advantage in a much more competitive and dynamic land environment. We need to continue to argue the relevance and importance of land power in response to those who would challenge its utility in the cyber age an argument compounded by the potentially toxic legacy of intervention. In the wake of Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya, there is still a debate over the wider utility of armed force, which of course exists in many respects not to fight conflicts, 
but to preserve peace, albeit through the credible threat of the use of force. And there can be no complacency in reinforcing those arguments. And for that deterrent effect, the currency is a capable, manned, trained and equipped army that's ready to fight, and demonstrably so. An army that matches operational agility with sustainable degrees of organisational and structural stability, that's adapted to iterative cycles of experimentation, capability development, the demands of our alliance obligations and the associated interoperability challenges. But the hooks exist, and it makes sense to play to our strengths. And the Army is starting to adapt to a profile of use which is far more relevant to the security challenges ahead. Considerable steps have already been taken to escape this binary mindset of peace and war, operations or training. And in most respects, it is now one continuous spectrum, and the Army's outputs are contributing to the reduction of the risk of conflict through protection and security tasks, such as enhanced forward presence in Estonia and Poland, and security upstream through building stability overseas and capacity building and reinforcing those essential international alliances and partnerships, including exploiting our own unique set of bilateral and multinational alliances, testing the boundaries of sovereign ownership with revised mechanisms for the pooling and sharing of capabilities. Because this is, in every sense, a team sport, and we're going to have to go further together. The Army needs to be used, and the Army needs to be useful, continuously, proportionately, and demonstrably. And it needs to continue to lend intellectual energy to the debate as to how warfare is changing in the information age. Because it does feel as though we're on the cusp of a step change. But I think the concepts and the associated technologies are still little understood, especially by the senior and by definition older end of the organization. And those who perhaps have the best grasp of their potential application are still quite junior and probably today find it just as hard to get their voice heard as we did. So there's definitely something here about how the Army thinks and prepares itself for the future whilst having to deal with the reality of today. Not least because Russia seems to have taken a different body of lessons from the historical evidence of intervention over the last 15 to 20 years, including the utility of hard power in changing the facts on the ground. And it's demonstrated that it's prepared to use military force to protect its vital national interests. I hope Mungo Melvin, our resident Crimean expert, might agree that Russia took the view that it couldn't cope with losing influence in the Crimea, whilst the West probably could. And Russia therefore took a rational risk, judging correctly that the Crimea was doable. And the logic for Syria was similar. And no amount of information advantage is going to change that calculus or the hard facts. So there are some recurring watchwords amongst all of this. Agility and adaptability, interoperability, integration and tempo. And what do they mean for us? Well, I think it points us in several directions, and the Minister has already highlighted many of them this morning, so I'll maybe underline just a couple. The first is the emphasis on training and experimentation in the context of a force operating in high-intensity conditions, particularly in complex terrain, dense electronic environments, and under persistent surveillance. This is multi-domain manoeuvre at the very high end. 
requiring exceptional special-to-arm competence, concise operational staff work, precise control, and intimate coordination with both air and allied forces, and doing so at points of the compass where the active demonstration of utility and capability reinforces our deterrent effect. We are already training to the threshold of failure to promote learning and experimentation and the integration and exploitation of technologies that link the physical, the virtual and the cognitive domains. But to go further and faster, we need to expand our simulation capabilities. We need to better understand how we might improve the human digital interface and we need to better visualize what task organization in the virtual domain looks like. We must continue to improve our digital collaboration and capacity for sharing because we've got to do that in partnership with allies. As the challenge of interoperability only increases as we take technological leaps forward. Maybe a start would be an agreed doctrine for the application of emerging technology. The second point I'd emphasize is the necessity to accelerate the pipeline between operational concepts, requirements, through acquisition to fielding. We need a quicker route to demonstration and rapid prototyping so that if we're going to fail, we fail early and cheaply, whilst carrying the lessons forward with families of evergreen platforms. Platforms that are adaptable and modular and crucially integrated from the outset into the data network to ensure compatibility with what we can only assume will be a growing armada of autonomous platforms and even more alternative virtual systems. My last point is how people fit into all this, because the demands on them are only growing. We're asking them to be combat ready today and prepared for tomorrow, persistently engaged overseas to deter and protect, whilst remaining positively engaged and connected at home, contributing to both national security and to enhancing our national prosperity. And for that, we need to draw on the whole force, not just regulars, reservists, civil servants, contractors and industry partners. That's the force we went to war with in 1991, 27 years ago. I'm talking about a different sort of whole force. I'm talking about the sort of people whose skills are going to be necessary to underwrite success on the 21st century battlefield. And this isn't just a challenge for the Army, it's a strategic challenge for the whole of defence. Because to compete, we need new non-traditional skills, skills not normally associated with those looking for careers in defence or the Army. People whose aptitudes are highly sought after in a global market and whose instincts are more independently minded and less hierarchical than some in uniform would feel comfortable with. And they'll make different demands on our leadership if we're to attract this more diverse team and integrate them successfully into a team of teams that goes close to reflecting the values of our army. Now it's for defence to overhaul the policy. That's essentially an issue about mobility and flexibility. But we'll still need to provide the leadership, the inspiration and the motivation that goes beyond a common set of values, because that produces a decent army. What I'm talking about is a winning army. A winning army founded on comradeship, self-respect and self-discipline. A winning army imbued with initiative and daring, with originality and self-confidence, 
with professional knowledge and infectious energy in all its commanders at all levels. I'm talking about an inextinguishable will to win, a relentless pursuit of professional excellence and a determination not to be thwarted by the inevitable setbacks. And that's to be matched by an entrepreneurial spirit that encourages and rewards an open, collaborative and challenging culture. I place a great premium on those hard-won lessons from the battlefield, on decentralization, on intelligent cooperation, speed of action and low-level initiative, coupled with the confidence to underwrite those honest mistakes of subordinates that develop their warfighter's instinct and experience, and a code of leadership that values the irrepressible sense of humour of the British soldier, that keeps things in proportion and fundamentally has a sense of humility and an honest sense of decency. All of these things exist in our army, and if they didn't, I wouldn't be stood in front of you today as the Chief of the General Staff. But occasionally, commanders need to breathe new life into these things, and that time is now. If I were to brand it, it would be as intelligent, dynamic, and adaptive warfighting professionals, recognizing that we're paid to fight and to win. That's a unique responsibility on behalf of our nation. And as commanders and leaders, our prime responsibility is to the nurture and the nourishment of the fighting spirit of our men and women. It's what they joined the army for, and their martial spirit is the only true litmus test of our readiness. If we keep it bright, my experience is that the rest will follow. And we are all custodians of something exceptionally precious, not just our army, but our nation's army. And it's made from flesh and blood and beating hearts. Thank you very much.